But my dad pastors at First Baptist Church of Flynn, Texas. Uh, if you don't know where Flynn is, join the club. It's, uh, it's about, uh, it's just north of Madisonville, and he's been there for a few years now. He served the Lord in ministry, was a fireman growing up, and then the Lord called him to ministry and retired as a fireman and then entered the ministry full time and has been doing that for a very long time. And so I've asked him to come and speak to us today and to preach. And if, if my dad taught me anything in ministry, it's how to be long-winded. And so you can all thank him for that today. <laughs> Uh, but dad, circumstances are a little different here. We pay for every hour extra that we use. And so we need you to uh, kind of keep it relatively short. Um, and I was just going to tell Kai, Kai, you can tell is called the ministry because you thought he was done. And he's like, oh, I'm not done yet. There's still more sermon to preach here, people. Like, I ain't done. I got a full lot of time. And so, man, it's just been amazing to see God work in the lives of these young people. So dad, why don't you come and uh, give us the word of God this morning? Would you join me in welcoming my dad? Mm-hmm. Well, hold this, Bob. As I've gotten older, everything's bigger. <laughs> so I have a heavyweight Bible. Let's we'll see if it goes down. Not yet. How am I supposed to get around all these wires? Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Here, you want to come forward? Well, maybe. We're going to begin and end in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter. It's good to be here. We have 11 grandchildren. All our grandchildren are here today. So far. I, I don't know who's going to have some more, but anyway. Not us. <laughs> Not us. My pages have gotten bigger over the years as my eyes got worse, okay? So. <laughs> Once saved, always saved. Baptists have been accused of having that theology so we can just get saved and go out and do whatever we want to. Y'all ever heard that before? I'm sure some of you had. And the truth is, that's exactly what we can do, but what people don't know is when you really get Jesus into your heart, as a young man testified, your want to's begin to change. You got a new nature in you. You're still a sinner in the flesh, but you got the nature of God living in you, and so He's working in you to change your want to's. Want to read in Matthew 11. Now we're going to read a few verses and we're going to come back there at the end. Now when John, this is John the Baptist, John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me or in me. The word offended means caused to stumble. Let's pray. Father, we do ask your blessing upon this time, and I pray, Lord, that this is rightly divided, and I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified here as we come around your word today. Thank you for the testimonies of these young folks and how that you've worked in their lives through these camps, Father. And we pray your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Satan's first attack on the new Christian is doubt. He'll make you doubt if it's real. He'll speak to you to doubt whether that can really be true. Where all you got to do is believe in somebody's death, burial, and resurrection, and you're given eternal life. It's a recurring problem. We've been to camp. I started in 1978, one year, 2010, I didn't go to camp. And all the other years, I've been to camp. This year we had two camps for ages first grade through high school. We had 13 people saved in those camps. And a few weeks ago I baptized eight people in one Sunday, which is the most I've ever baptized in one Sunday. And then two more, two more a week later, and we still have two more to be baptized. So camp has been in my own life, the greatest evangelistic tool we've ever had. 
One year when Robbie and Casey and Sam and Rodney were going to camp, we had 26 professions of faith in a camp. Another year, we had 22 professions of faith just from our group in camp. And so camp is such a great way to bring people to Christ. You see, you get away from the world and away from all the distractions and you're, you're closed up with some good Christian people who love you. You're hearing concentrated doses of Jesus and, and so he begins to stir in people's heart. And he begins to answer those questions like, is there really a God? Is, or is there not a God? Is evolution true? Which it can't be true. Because even the evolutionists say, yes, there had to be something. And so when they get to the end of chasing that something, they're going to find that, that creator God. It's a lot easier to believe that God did it instead of it just blowing up out of nothing. So, so it's something that's never ending because if Satan can get us doubting whether God is good, whether our conversion was genuine, he's got us where he wants us. Because we're not going to be full of joy. We're not going to be reaching out to people with the gospel if we have a Savior that may not really have done the job. And we will not bring anyone to Jesus. But I have some Bible verses for you today. And we're going to talk about what the Bible says about the issue of once saved, always saved. Did you know that about 90% of what's called Christianity don't believe that? They believe that you can be saved and then something's got to be added or some standard maintained or you're not, your salvation ain't real and you're not going to make it. But the important thing is what does God say? So I have a few things that, a few facts for you. Number one, Jesus will not cast you out. In the sixth chapter of John, it's a pivotal time in the ministry of Christ. And so he says this in verse 37. This is Jesus' words. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. No buts, no accepts, no unlesses. Whoever comes to me in faith, I will never cast out. And then in verse 40, in the same passage, he said, for this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. In the book of Philippians we have this wonderful passage about how Jesus became flesh and he became a man and he wasn't just a robot that looked like a man, he was a man and as a man he humbled himself to death, even the death of the cross. And so then because he did that and was resurrected, verse 10 says, the Father has given him all power in heaven and in earth. So he's the one that's got the power. You don't have the power. You don't need the power. He's the one that keeps you. He will never cast you out. Number two, no person can take you from Jesus. In the 10th chapter of John, there's an analogy drawn between Jesus and the shepherd. And in verse 27, he says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now to understand that, you got to understand what he's using to illustrate it. The sheep at night, the shepherds would bring their sheep into a sheepfold. Three, four, five, six shepherds, however many, they would bring their sheep to a place where there's water and a place where they can watch over all the sheep and then they would take turns sleeping while some stood guard. Now they lived in a desert country, so, and a shepherd could tend only up to a hundred sheep. And so before daylight, the shepherds would come to get their flock out of that mess of sheep. And so what they did, each shepherd had a distinct call that he used, and the sheep knew his voice, and so he would just come and make this call, and all of his sheep would follow him, and he would take them out to pasture. So the Lord's using that, that these people knew about to illustrate him being the shepherd. Now, his voice, you need to understand this, his voice is his word. Let me make this statement now. God will never lead you against anything that's in his word. He will never lead you 
against anything that's in His Word. It's been settled for thousands of years now. This is, this is His message for us. He will never go against it. And so of these sheep, verse 28, He says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father which has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. No one can take you away from Jesus. Number three, I cannot do something to lose salvation. Where's Adam? Hello Adam. So now a few days after Adam was saved this year, he, they come and stayed a couple of days at our house. And so he has, as most new, newly saved people do, he has a lot of questions. And he was asking me these questions. And one of the things he said was, but what if I do bad things? Well, he probably don't do any bad things. I don't see them. But anyway, <laughs> so he said, but what if I do bad things, Grandpa? And I said, well, you can't do enough bad things. For Jesus to, to not, for you not to be saved anymore. So you can't do something to lose salvation, number three. Nor can you neglect to do something to lose your salvation. If you read this Bible, you will find some pretty sorry acting people that are in heaven today. In the Genesis, there's a story of a man named Lot. And most of you have heard of him, but Lot, history in the Old Testament closes on Lot hiding in a cave after his hometown Sodom had been burned to the ground. He's hiding in a cave and he, out of an incestuous affairs with his daughters, he is both daddy and grandpa to his two grandchildren. And that's about as low as you can go. And you think there's a man that busted hell wide open. But then you get to the, to the book of 2 Peter and you find out that he is in heaven. Or what about Moses? Remember when God called Moses to deliver his people from, from Egypt and Moses got ahead of God. God told him, go out and visit my people. And he goes out and tries to take the leadership. And what do you do with a, an Egyptian beating a Pharaoh, beating a, a Hebrew? He killed him. And buried him in the sand. So to do the will of God, he goes out and murders somebody. What a great upstanding believer he was, right? And how about David, the man after God's own heart? He had many adulterous affairs and wound up having an affair with a woman named Bathsheba. And he committed adultery. She became pregnant. And so then David had his, her husband killed in war. So he could take his wife. Now he didn't get away with that, that but that's a different story. But, but what I want you to understand is if he, if they didn't lose their salvation, you're probably not going to lose you. How, how many of you heard of a guy named Jeffrey Dahmer? Most of you kids don't remember him, but a lot of us do. And he killed and ate people. And when they finally searched his apartment, he had to he had parts of 17 different people in his refrigerators. Man, is that nasty? So he gets a life sentence, but his daddy was a Christian and his daddy kept sending him evangelical material and he got in prison and he got away from the demons that had possessed him all his life through the use of drugs. Stay away from them, people. And so, and so, and this, this uh, minister followed up what his dad had done and that man in prison became a believer and was baptized in prison. Now, he died at the hands of another inmate, so, so that guy just took a Christian out of his misery is what he did. And he didn't even know it. It's hard for us to fathom Jeffrey Dahmer being a Christian. But in 1980, when a lot of you guys were going to camp, all my kids were going to camp. We carried this precious young lady to camp near Groveton to Piney Woods, and her name was Vicki Lynn. And her brother played on Sam's T-ball team. I was his coach. And Vicki Lynn was always wanting to help. She wanted to pass out the refreshments, and she did all of this. She just wanted people to like her and wanted to be important. And so she went to camp in 1980 with us, and some of y'all went. 
He just didn't know who he was at camp with. And the Sunday after we got back from camp, or the next Sunday, I'm not sure which, she wanted to talk to my wife and I about being saved. And so in our kitchen at Belmar Baptist Church, while Brother Ed is in there spinning three rows deep preaching, we sat with the Bible and talked to Vicki Lynn, and she became a believer in Christ. I'm convinced of it. Now, we never got to disciple her. It's important that you guys who are just beginning your spiritual journey, learn all you can about the Lord. And, and ultimately, that's going to come from the Word of God. But you probably, if you've heard of her, she later became Anna Nicole Smith. And in 2007, she died of a drug overdose at the age of 39 after her 20-year-old son had died of an overdose two years before. I am convinced I'm convinced that she was saved. Her parents, her family wouldn't let her be baptized, so she never got to be a disciple. We never got to teach her anything after salvation. And so that all becomes so blurred to her, and she turned into this horrible lady. And I think God took her out of her misery uh, when she was 39 years old. She was probably shocked when she went to heaven. That's what I think. But I know this. If she genuinely trusted Jesus in our kitchen, then she did go to heaven when she died. So I want you to understand, you're good. You can't do something to lose your salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, a lot of people teach coming to Jesus and then they teach you got some spiritual hoops you got to keep jumping through. If you stray too far away, you're not going to be saved anymore. And the Galatians in the New Testament believe that and Paul wrote them. And you know what he asked them? He said, who has possessed you with a demon? Who has bewitched you that you think that you can add to what God did by your own works? And so in verse 10, Three, chapter 3, verse 10, listen to this. I'll tell you what I did coming down here this morning. I set my wife's cruise control, I'm driving her car, on 77. We only passed three trucks. Everybody else is zooming by us and giving you that look like, what are you doing on the highway, Grandpa? I'm going 77 miles per hour. <laughs> They're speeding faster. But I want you to understand something. Was I breaking the law? I was breaking the law, okay? Didn't matter if I'm breaking a little bit or a lot, I'm still breaking the law. And look at what Galatians 3.10 says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, curse be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. So when you break one part of the law, you're a lawbreaker. It's the same in our day. I broke the law. Lord, forgive me for breaking the law. On the way. <laughs> in verse 21, chapter 2, verse 21, listen to this. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. I want you to think about that for a moment. If God would do that to His Son, the only perfect human being that's ever been and stayed that way, then what's he going to do to you and me? We, we're in trouble aplenty. And so why would he put him through that if what he did wasn't going to be enough? That doesn't make any sense to think that at all. How about number four? There's nothing in all creation that could cause me to lose my salvation. I'm glad. As I've gotten older, I, I have a less patience. And so I find myself hurting my wife's feelings because I don't handle nagging as well as I used to. Right? <laughs> so when I say something, when I say something to her, she just, she tears up so quick. So I, I got to stop that anyway. <laughs> the eighth chapter of Romans is this beautiful chapter. And it's, it's about... It's about adoption. How many people in here have been adopted by somebody? Stand up and let us look at you. Stand up. Stand up. I know you two over here. Huh? Ellie, come on, Ellie, stand up. 
That's awesome. All right, you may, you may sit down. In verse 22 of that chapter, it says that the whole creation is groaning like a woman having, giving childbirth. Some of y'all are familiar with that. Groaning and hollering and yelling at your husband, don't ever come near me again, and all those things. And so, so it's not an easy thing to go through, I'm told, all right? So, but I want you to look down at verse 38 and 39 that summarizes up security. Paul writes to them and says, for I am sure that neither death, when you, when you die, you can't lose it, nor life. Nothing in life can cause you to lose it, nor angels. You know, angels are around us all the time. Do you know that? When you swing your arm out, you might hit two or three of them, but you didn't even know it. They're around us all the time. And so, and those angels, I'm sure, sometimes get offended when they see Christians taking advantage of the grace of God and they're going to heaven and living like hell. And that, that has to make those angels sorrowful, I think. But the angels can't do anything about it. They can't zap us because God is their boss, nor rulers. We don't have to worry. Neither Pelosi nor Trump can take away our salvation <laughs> or any other ruler, nor things present. There's nothing going on now that's going to cause us to not be saved. Nor things to come. There's nothing in the future that will cause us to not be saved. Nor powers. That's an interesting word because that's a word in the Greek that talks about the demonic legions of people. They're not of the devil. There's not any in here unless you brought one with you. And I'm not talking about small children either, okay? Because I asked the Lord to hedge us about and keep the forces of evil from here. So get this in your get this in your mind. Surrounding us are this are God's angels, and the devils are trying to get in here, and the angels are keeping them from it. You say, that ain't true. Yes, it is. That's what God does. He's got two angels for every one demon the devil's got. So they're outnumbered and they're overmatched. So no power can take it. How about this? Nor height. Nor height. How many of you watched the 50th anniversary of the moon landing this week? Well, at least a few of you old folks did. <laughs> My wife and I watched that at the Redstone Apartments in Houston. We were, I was 19, she was 18. We pulled the black and white TV out where we could sit in the swimming pool and watch that on TV as the first man stepped on the moon. Isn't it amazing nobody else has done it but us? Yes, USA, number one, right? And so that was, that was an astonishing thing to watch. And guess what? They didn't find anything up there that could cause us to not be saved. And if you keep going, I'm told that the universe is endless, and who created it? God created it, and he said there's nothing anywhere up there that can take it away nor depth, so there's nobody below us that can wreck our salvation. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I have the fifth one I want to ask a question. You don't answer it because you might be embarrassed if you're wrong. But can you renounce Jesus as your Savior? I don't want you no more. Get out of my life. I, I, I'm not interested. Can you do that? And I've known a few people that believe that. So when you go out the back door of our church in Flynn, about 200 yards away is this property, and they, they live on a little road close to us. So about a year ago, another guy and I stopped. We're just knocking doors. And we discovered this couple living where they can see the church, and first we talked to the lady. She said, you could say I'm an angry Christian. And so what had happened in their life, they had had all three of their children had been murdered. And the last one, their girl, her husband killed her by stuffing toilet paper down her mouth until she choked to death. And she said, what kind of God, I don't want nothing to do with him, would let that happen 
to my sweet kids. Now just around our corner is another lady that's buried four out of her five children. She's 92 years old and she's sweet as she can be. She never lost hold on God. But I'm not sure what I would do if I'd been in that situation. But so she had decided I don't even want to be a believer. So I told her, I said, well, it doesn't matter what you decided. If you ever believed in him, he's got you. And so, so they've been very respectful when I visited them, but, but they cannot, you cannot renounce the Lord and decide you're not going to be saved anymore because it's not up to you. Now let me give you a verse for it. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 13. This is the ESV version. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So no matter, you can't renounce him. There was a guy that worked for me in the fire department in about 1980. Might have been early in 81, but anyway, I, he, I want him to Christ through Bible lessons at the fire station. I don't think you were supposed to do that, but nobody ever stopped me. So, so anyway, I saw him after I had some years later, about five years later, run into him at our credit union. Now, every fireman that ever existed knows where the credit union was. And so, so I said, how are you doing? How's your family? And are you still going to that church where you were baptized? He said, I'm not a Christian anymore. He lost his family. His wife had divorced him. He lost his family. He said, I'm a Buddhist. I, I, I like to do meditation. I said, well, you might have, should have meditated on scripture before you decided that. But so he just laughed at me. I said, well, it doesn't matter if what, what you did at station 46 was real, then you can't get away from Jesus. And if nothing else, he's just going to take you out of here someday, take you home. So about three or four years later, I saw him again. Guess where? At the credit union. Yes. <laughs> So I asked him, I said, are you still being a Buddhist? He said, no. He said, you was right. He said, <laughs> said, I couldn't get away from him. My wife came back to me. We're involved in church. So hallelujah. It had a, at least at that time, it had a happy ending. But you cannot renounce him and be lost. How many of you think that there's a possibility he might go a little bit goofy someday? Some of us started early, right? And so... So you may not always have all your marbles in the right spot. And, and so I'm getting there. I'm, I'm so old now, you can say anything you want to and get away with it usually, even, even preaching. But so, so anyway, we don't know what's going to happen to us. We don't know if we're going to have Alzheimer's or if we've already got it or dementia. It's all the same when you, when you start to go off your gourd. And we might wind up not even remembering whether we got saved. But it's not up to us. God remembers it. And he's got, it, he's got it covered. Five reasons, five assurances, five in the Word of God's a number of grace. Now let me quickly give you three things that God says that should give you great assurance. Number one, you find this in the John the third chapter. You were born of God when you believed. In verse 5, Jesus talked to a man named Nicodemus, and he says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So born of water, he's talking about physical childbirth. When the water breaks, the baby's going to fall. If he don't follow pretty quick, you better get to the doctor. And so... So that's the, uh, the fleshly birth. And then you're born of God. This is some heavenly biology here. No matter what happens in your life, your mother and father biologically are never going to change. Now some of you have been adopted. So your functioning mother and father, your real mom and daddy are your adopted parents. I promise. I don't know the circumstances, but I promise. That's your real folks, all right? And so... But you are born as God's child when you believe. That's what that passage teaches. And you cannot be unborn. How about this action? You are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. He comes into you and he seals your soul and you will never commit a sin that gets into your soul. 
You are innocent as a newborn baby every day the rest of your life, no matter what you're doing, because God cannot deny his son. And so Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says this. This is why you felt better all of a sudden when you trusted Jesus. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. That's pretty good sealing right there. When the Holy Spirit comes into your soul, that's the part of you you can't see. I think the best way to talk about your soul is the part of you that makes choices where you're able to choose. And so when you chose Jesus as your Savior, he chose you as his child and the Holy Spirit of God came in there to seal the deal. And how about this one? You are adopted. So all our adopted people, hold your hands up again. Now let me tell you something. All right? You can't be disinherited from your family. Do you know that? So if Adam messes up, mom and dad can cut him out of the wheel. But no matter how Ellie messes up, they can't cut her out of the will. Because it's illegal to, to disinherit an adopted child. That will get you locked up. Isn't that cool? So we're not only born, not only are we born of God, we're sealed by the Spirit of God, but we are adopted. In the 8th chapter of Romans it says this, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Or Abba, or Daddy God is another way that could be translated. The Spirit himself bears witness that our spirit that we are the children of God. Listen to this. If children and heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Wow. Whatever Jesus has got, I have got. Because I've been adopted as a son. And that's going to be a, a stature that never leaves. So the greatest questions I've been asked are these two. How can I know for sure? When I'm staring death in the face, when the darkness closing in, when I'm about to leave here, how can I know for sure? When life assaults me and overwhelms me, Brother Jonathan, whenever you can't understand what's going on and you doubt whether God's got your best interests at heart, anybody else ever have that? Like, what are you doing, God? Well, he's just running his universe. And you know what he told Job? He said, all you got to do is create yourself one and run it. Then I'll say that you, you can save yourself by your own right hand. And so, so you can know for sure when I'm staring death in the face, I can know for sure. And 1 John, the fifth chapter, is a great reference. Verse, let's begin to verse 11. This is a testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Doesn't say that you may guess, that you may feel like you really have it. The second question is this, what if I don't feel saved? Like the poor lady neighbor at our church up there. 1 John 3.20, look at this. For whenever our heart condemns us, Whenever you've done something so evil, whenever you've drifted away from God, whenever you're mad at God and, and, and you don't even talk to Him because you don't want to tell Him that you're mad, well, guess what? He knows what you're going to think before you think it. So you might as well just go ahead and tell Him, God, I'm mad at you. Please forgive me and help me not to be mad at you. Whenever, God con whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and He knows everything. In chapter 2 of 1 John verse 25, and this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. 
Titus 1.12 says, In the hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages begin. So there's an old saying, you might have said it. You need to change it up a little bit. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Now let's change it up a little bit. God said it. And that settles it. Whether I believe it or not, don't have any bearing on whether it's settled. It's settled in the eyes of God. So let's go back to Matthew 6, 6 as we, I mean Matthew 11 as we close. John the Baptist, do you remember what he said? He had baptized Jesus. Jesus went out for his 40 days of temptation. When he came back, he came to the, to the same place where John was baptizing. And John saw him coming on the banks of the Jordan. And what did he say? Do you remember? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All those Jews knew what he was talking about. It's the Passover lamb where the little innocent lamb was brought into the family. Everybody got to know him as a pet. And on Passover they took the little lamb out, bent his head back, and cut his throat and bled him out in this pot. And then that blood was used as a sacrifice in any way. So that's a picture of Jesus. So when he said that, behold the Lamb of God, he's, he's carrying them back to that thing they did every year religiously without fail when they slew a lamb to celebrate the Passover. So that was when the things were good and the crowds were coming and John's preaching and he's calling all those holy, holier than now people uh, a den of snakes. He said, you're of your father the devil. But now, because he called somebody out on an adultery issue, he's in prison. And he's about to have his head separated from his body. And so now, in the deepest, darkest time of his life, what's entered his heart? Doubt. Are you really the one? Or do we look for another? So let's read what Jesus said. Jesus told him, he said, go tell him I'm doing these works. Those works were Old Testament prophesied. This is what the Messiah will do when he comes. And so you know what he said to, in essence to John? Go back and read your scriptures that you've been studying and fasting over for 30 years in the wilderness, in the desert. And so then look at what he said about this doubting guy who's wondering if he's really real. He says, he began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man draw, dressed in soft clothing. He wore the hide of a camel and ate grasshoppers. That's what, he, that's what he did. Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. And I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way among you. Listen to this. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist except the one that was doing the speaking, of course, but he didn't include himself, but he went and laid his life down to pay for every sin that has ever been committed or ever will be committed. The worst sinner that ever lived had his sins paid for. The main thing is to accept your payment by faith. And I pray that you all have. We're going to pray and I'm going to ask Brother Robbie to come. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for these kids that have been changed by camp. Thank you for all those years when you've done through camp wonderful things in the hearts of people. And I pray now for this church and the people in it, pray, Lord, that it would truly be a lighthouse and a hospital for hurting people in this place or wherever God directs them to. Father, just ask you now to bless this time. Be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.